الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله صحبه ملاه اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما I apologize for being away for two weeks now but have a lot of work going on therefore it was difficult for me uh, to be on time uh, we'll continue our talk about da'wah strategies of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, today I'll focus on uh, the method of selectivity that the Prophet ﷺ used to follow. I mean, how he would select people for certain tasks of da'wah. This indicates that the Prophet ﷺ studies his companions very well and makes sure that he will choose the right person for the right mission, for the right mission, for the right work. Uh, so this indicates that he was very close to his companions. He knew them very well. And I was really astonished how much the Prophet ﷺ would know about his companions. Uh, one of the companions of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was named Hudayfa. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiyallahu anhu. And uh, there is another Ubay ibn Ka'b, another Ali ibn Abi Talib. And we'll talk about how he selected Duhya al-Kalbi. And some of those people were selected for different work. When the people of Yemen requested somebody to go to them, he nominated one of his companions. You remember him? First of all, the people of Yemen are different from the people of Mecca and different from the people of Medina in different ways. That Yemen, through history, used to be a, a center of knowledge, a center of knowledge. And many of the religions were taking place there, like there were Christians, and there were Jews, and there were others. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ nominated one of his companions named Mu'adh ibn Jabal. You know Mu'adh ibn Jabal? And Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And he has certain qualities that others may not have that, would, that he would be suitable for this job, for this job. When he sent some, somebody to people of knowledge, of books, the Torah and the Injil, he sent somebody who is very knowledgeable. It's different from sending somebody to people who are pagan, who worship idols, you see? So he selected Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu and he even walked along with him. And he said, Ya Mu'adh, you're going to people of book, for book, for knowledge. So the first thing that you call them for is La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. You see, he's giving da'wah strategy. We don't make debates. We don't call them for uh, like to have a good life, how to enjoy yourself, how to get rid of your problems. Although these could be da'wah strategies. But those people start with Tawheed. And we know that Christians and Jews share a lot with us. That many Christian and Jews believe in Allah. But sometimes in a different way. They associate with Allah, I see. But they, don't, they believe in the prophets. Christians believe almost in all prophets. Uh, they believe in the day of judgment. They believe in angels. So this is part of La ilaha illallah. But they don't believe in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu as a prophet. If they would believe in him as a prophet, the problem would be solved. So he said, you start with them. If they accept that, and this is the strategy for us as well, for people of the book. If they accept that, then you tell them that we have five daily required prayers. And if they accept that, tell them that we have fasting. We fast one month. And every year it is during the month of Ramadan. See how gradually he's going with them? And if they accept that, tell them that they take a small amount of their wealth to pay for zakah. And it will be given to their poor people. And it will not be even given to you or anybody. It will be to their own society. Now you create a Muslim society, you see? You started with Salah, you believe in Allah, you have 
beautiful tawheed, very firm tawheed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You believe in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu you take him as your role model and example. Then you go to salah, you develop yourself, you take care of yourself, you discipline yourself, you're committed, you pray on time. You know that salah requires wudu, tahara, you know all these things. Recitation of the Quran, you teach them. You say it's not a matter of la hatta ya it's not an easy, you go gradually with them. If they really stable with Salah, now they perform Salah and they're good for that. You cannot ask somebody to fast who, has, who doesn't make Salah. And some Muslims fast and they don't pray. Their fasting is not acceptable because really they have nullified their Iman, their Islam. <laughs> they're not Muslims. If you don't pray, you're not there. Fasting will not be accepted from a non-Muslim. You see, then you go to something else, which is now talk about fasting. You become more conscious, you develop your taqwa, you come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you observe your own conduct, nobody is really observing you. Then you go to something, you create a community, you see, of zakah, because zakah creates a community. The poor people will be taken care of, there is very strong relation between the rich and the needy. So you create a Muslim community. If they accept that, tell them they could go once in their lifetime for hajj if they can afford it. So, and the Prophet selected who? Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And the Prophet said about Mu'adh, that Mu'adh is the most knowledgeable among my ummah. يُبْعَثُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَ وَبَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ رِتْوَةِ In the day of judgment, he will be directed and he will be having long distance in front of the, all the scholars. He is superseding them. And Mu'adh was very young was very young. The reports say that he died at the age of 33. <laughs> you see, some people think those people are 75, 80. No, but they were very close to the Prophet ﷺ. They picked knowledge from him and Mu'adh among the most knowledgeable people. Is Mu'adh from Ansar or from Muhajireen? He's from the Ansar. That tells you that he was not there in Mecca. And he learned only from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in Medina. A look in how much in a short time he was able to learn. You see? You have a question? Not Mu'adh. That is Hudayfa. That's Hudayfa ibn Yaman. Okay. So this is a mission that requires a very knowledgeable person who could speak with very great base of knowledge you see you're talking about scholars rabbis priests cardinals people who have been this religion for a long time and they have knowledge about their own religion you cannot send anybody to them somebody who is later on the prophet sallam, sent ali ibn abi talib and abu musa al-ash'ari ali ibn abi talib is the one who built the mosque in central yemen i went to that mosque in sana'a have you been there ali Ali Abi Talib's mosque, okay, and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari went to Tehama, okay, to Zabit and other places where the, I went to the masjid of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, the place where he built the masjid there. So the Prophet sallallahu followed different strategies we see for da'wah. The Prophet sallallahu followed the strategy of da'wah of sending letters to the kings and he used to select people who could do, we call it, high standard public relations high standard public relations and his public relations officer who went to the kings was named Dihyatul Kalbi Dihya Al Kalbi have you heard of this name it's very interesting Dihya anyway uh, Jibreel alayhi salam used to come in the form of a man in the shape of Dihya Al Kalbi this is one thing he walked in Medina, people think that this is Dihya Al-Kalbi walking, and he was Jibreel alayhi salam. Dihya Al-Kalbi was very handsome, very handsome. And usually when you go for public relations, you take somebody who is really taking care of himself. You speak to the kings, you speak to the kings, and you need somebody who really represents Islam in the best form. And he must be a very good speaker, good speaker. So the Prophet وسلم, selected different people for different purposes. Are you with us, Ya Khwan? They're busy with that paper. 
<laughs> so Allahumma salli ala Rasulillah. Uh, the Prophet selected Dahiya for that mission, for that task, for that important mission. And uh, in other situations, when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca and he went for Sulh al for Hudaybiyah before the treaty was signed, he wanted to go for Umrah. He was going for Umrah. And he thought the Quraysh would not prevent him from going to Umrah. No, you don't have any right to prevent anybody to go to Haram. Okay, any Muslim could go to make, make Umrah. You cannot prevent your visa is to be Muslim. This is your, the only requirement to go is to get that your visa is a Muslim. You go there. So pagans used to go there. And nobody would prevent them. How would come they would prevent somebody who recognized Ibrahim alayhi salam? Ismail alayhi salam. The people who built the Kaaba itself. Now you reject them. So the Prophet and his companion thought they wouldn't really do that. But they stopped them at Hudaybiyah, see? Because Hudaybiyah on the boundaries of Haram. You go Hudaybiyah, you know Shemesi when you go to Jeddah, and when you come from Jeddah and that is the small mosque, that is the place of Hudaybiyah. They call it Shemesi nowadays, but it's Hudaybiyah. Okay? This is the boundaries of Haram. The boundaries of Haram. Quraysh stopped them, see? You cannot let you get into the boundaries of Haram. So the Prophet ﷺ sent a man to negotiate with them. A man with certain characteristics, with a caliber to go to Quraysh. You know that man? Who was that? Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu. Why Uthman was selected? Let's look at those people that the Prophet, he could have selected anybody else. Why Uthman? Why not Abu Bakr? Why not Umar? Why not Ali? Why not Sa'ad ibn Ubadah? Why not? He was highly respected by the Quraysh's. That's true. What else? He was indigenous Quraishi. He didn't select anybody from Ansar. He selected somebody from Quraysh. If somebody from Ansar would come to them and say, you're not from us and you have nothing to do with us, Zakallah khair, go back home. Okay? You see? And I wanted to see the intelligence of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The decisions that he make, we need to study them. So that would help us in our da'wah when he makes such kind of decisions. What else? Uthman cannot be bribed. He's very rich. Okay, Uthman cannot be bribed. Okay? Yani he's, he didn't come for business. He didn't come for uh, Mecca to, to get their money or to look at their wealth or they could really, I mean, no. And he belonged to one of the aristocratic families in Jahiliya, Bani Umayya, Umayya family, okay? His family is leading Quraysh. He's leading Quraysh. Abu Sufyan belongs to his. He and Abu Sufyan belong to the same family. Abu Sufyan was the leader of Quraysh. And I just want you to look at how the Prophet Sallallahu selected those people for these missions, for these missions. The last two that we stop with, inshallah, is when Al-Khandaq, in Al-Khandaq, although this is not only, uh, all the work that we do is da'wah work. Even jihad work is for the sake of inviting people to Islam. There is no reason if the da'wah could go to people with no I mean, military effort, there is no need for it. Okay? There is no need for it. Because the purpose of da'wah, the main goal of da'wah is to spread of the word of Allah. If people, un, if, if people can be reached without any force, there is no need to do it, okay? But if somebody is standing between the da'wah the, and the way of da'wah that, if it's a mountain, we dig a tunnel, if it's a river, we make a bridge, or we take a ship and go. If it's a tyrant, that tyrant could be, should be removed, okay? Because people have to be liberated. People have to listen to the word of Allah. Can you force people to accept Islam? No, but you should take, take even sometime by force the barriers that stand between people and Islam. Anyway, when the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions in Medina were surrounded by the Quraysh's in Ghazwat al-Khandaq, the battle of the trench, okay? They were surrounded by the Quraysh's and other tribes. 
So, and uh, the Prophet ﷺ would like to know about the other camp, the enemy camp. It is work of intelligence. He selected Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman for that. And Hudayfa is telling the story. It's a very interesting story. That when Hudayfa said, in a very dark night, a rainy night, the Prophet ﷺ gathered his commanders, his people of Shura, and he said, I want somebody of you, one of you, to go and find out what's going on the other camp, on the enemy camp. Hudayfa said, the Prophet looked around, nobody responded. It was a very fearful situation that Allah described. This is one of the most fearful situations that the companions went through. The most difficult situations in the history of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. No army in the history of Arabia has reached that level of preparation, of remedy, of command surrounding Medina. The hypocrites are declaring treason. The Jews declaring treason as well because they said oh, the contract, I mean the treaty between you and Muhammad is invalid. And those 10,000 armed to the teeth coming and surrounding Medina. And the, the companions and the Prophet were living in a very difficult time that are described in the Quran. They reach a very difficult situation. Hudayfa said, the Prophet said, said it for the second time. Who is going to find out about what the enemy is doing? The Prophet said, said, said for third time, who is going to find out about the enemy's camp? I'll promise him paradise. Imagine the situation, Ikhwan, how difficult it was. Nobody responded. The Prophet looked around and said, Where is Hudayfa? He said, I am here, O Prophet of Allah. Subhanallah, Ikhwan. When he speak to people directly, khalas, said, I want you to find out about what's going there. And don't make any action that the people will find about you. So why the Prophet selected Hudayfa? And not Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is better than Hudayfa. Not Umar. Not Mu'adh ibn Jabal, not Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Why? Probably he knows the place well. We don't know. Even we have many people of Medina who don't have a place. They are living in Medina. Okay. And he was very young. By the way, he was very young at that time. Has strong heart? Do you think he has a stronger heart than Abu Bakr? No. Than Umar? He has, he has the caliber, he has the skill, he has the training to do this mission because this is an intelligence mission and it is most, one, one of the most serious and dangerous missions. He could do a commando mission because he was prepared to do that. How did the Prophet ﷺ know about them, about him? Because, you know, the Prophet ﷺ selected him to be his secret keeper. He is the man of intelligence for the Prophet ﷺ. He knows secrets that Umar doesn't know. He knows secrets that Abu Bakr doesn't know. He knows secrets that only the Rasulullah knows. And this is why Umar used to come and ask him when he wanted to appoint somebody to be an Amir or in command in chief or something. He will go to Hudayfa and say, what do you think of this man? He say, fine. He is the one who is making decision because the, there are many hypocrites among the companions that they don't know about. Only Allah and his Prophet know about them. And the Prophet didn't tell anybody that this man is a hypocrite, that man is a hypocrite, no. Okay, because this will create a form of distrust among the companions. Those, when we, if we don't need them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of them. Khalas. It's not our responsibility to go into their hearts until this, the so-and-so is a hypocrite. No, it's not our business. But they will not be allowed to take a position where they will control the Muslim ummah. No. 
This is why Hudayfa was selected. And I'll tell you why Hudayfa was selected. By the action of Hudayfa himself, radiallahu anhu. He said, I went to the army of the enemy. And they didn't realize me. I, I really, he really was doing a work of espionage. Okay? Intelligence. And he said, Abu, Hudayfa, Abu Sufyan stood up and said, it's a very difficult night. At any one. And Muhammad is not fool not to try to find out about what's going on in our camps. So let every one of you recognize the one who is next to him. He said, immediately I went to the one next to me and say, what's your name? Who are you? He said, I'm so and so, you see. He's prepared to do that. He's having this capability, this caliber, this skill, you see. And he said, by Allah, I was in a point that I could kill Abu Sufyan. But I remember the words of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, I asked you to collect information, not do any action. Who will stand? You know, this is the enemy of Allah who collected 10,000 people from all of the Arab Peninsula and armed them and promised them everything that they wanted to kill the Prophet وسلم, and to uproot Islam. And I'm only one, two, three meters away from him. Why not doing that? You see, temptation there is very strong. He wouldn't care about his life. Let them kill me. But I killed the leader. But the Prophet وسلم, said, Don't take any action. Subhanallah, ya khuan. He doesn't speak out of himself. It's a matter of revelation that comes to the Prophet. وسلم. Abu Sufyan became a Muslim. This leader of Kufr has become one of the leaders of Islam. Allah knows better than we think. These are just samples, small samples of the selective procedure that the Prophet ﷺ used to follow and the basis on which he could select his companions to do these very important missions. غفر الله لي ولكم والمسلمين أجمعين وجمعنا بمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وصحبه الطاهرين في جنات عدن أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته